Okay, we are in chapter 4 of 1 Peter, chapter 4, starting in verse 1. Um, the only reason I'm going to, um, I, I can't bring you all up to speed on everything in this passage, which begins in chapter 3, verse 13, and will end as near as I can tell in chapter uh, 4, verse 6. So this particular portion dealing with um, uh, Peter preparing the hearers to, um, to consider uh, suffering for their faith, suffering literally because of Jesus, because of the good news that they possess and that they proclaim. And so we started that in verse 13. I'm not going to go back and read uh, uh, or preach that, but it ends in verse 17. It's a consideration of really how we're supposed to respond. There's great stuff in there. If you missed it, go back and listen to it on YouTube. Uh, there's the next section, which we covered two weeks ago, starting in verse 18 and ending in verse 22, a very, very difficult passage uh, in which, just starting, and I'm not going to go any further, but in verse 18, for Christ also suffered. And all of you are saying that's not what it says. It says, for Christ also died. And I'll just once again say that uh, the textual criticism on this, uh, texts are chosen, and uh, most of the uh, popular um, translations have gone ahead and translated it, die. And the reason I chose to go with another text and say, for Christ also suffered, is that it follows through, and I'm going to explain this because it's the first thing in chapter 4, verse 1, where it says, therefore, since Christ has suffered. I need to explain to you once again so that you'll be able to jump off into chapter 4, verse 1 with the concept of why it says suffered. Because that's how we started in verse 13. Who is there to harm you if you prove to be zealots of, of good things? And then in verse 14, but if also you suffer, you suffer for the sake of righteousness. And that's kind of the, the concept here of suffering in your faith. Suffering for your faith, suffering because of your faith. And when we get to verse 18 and our translations say, for Christ died, <clears throat> we, we, we miss the word uh, which is suffered and the concept. In fact, I'm going to turn back to Luke. I should have, should have done this earlier. Uh, to the portion in, in Luke 21... <clears throat> Uh, Luke 22, <laughs> Luke 22, which I have read up here in the pulpit in preparation for, um, for communion, in which in verse 14 of Luke 22, uh, Luke tells us, and when the hour had come, Jesus reclined at the table and the apostles with him, and he said to them, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. And I have always, and I apologize for this, I have always looked at that as the suffering prior to his death. Amen. But why would he say, I, I have desired to do this before I get slapped, punched, uh, have my head beat with a uh, thorny crown on it, have my beard plucked and my back lacerated and my hands pierced, and limit it to that. He doesn't. This suffering that he's talking about is a suffering unto, you got it, death. So you're saying, well, what's the, what's the big difference? Well, the big difference is that you and I, I mean... I, at least, think in terms that suffering is, is what, you know, uh, Christians around the world are, are suffering. They're suffering loss of jobs. They're suffering, suffering loss of, of, of spouses. They're put into prison. They're, they're uh, fined. Uh, and in some cases, obviously, we know by now that they are also beheaded. And, 
and suffer the loss of life, not just for their faith, but because of their faith in Jesus Christ. So when Jesus said, I've earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer, it's not simply the lacerations and the beard plucking. It is the entire process of suffering for who he was unto what he did. He died. And that's the concept that lays behind all of this suffering. And that's where we need to go. And I, I didn't catch that until uh, this week. And, um, you know, I, <clears throat> I can't speak for all pastors, but I, I can speak for me that when I find a passage that I know is going to be um, troublesome to explain, I spend more time in it. And then I realize I've spent a whole lot of time and I'm still not understanding it. It's like, okay, Lord, there's some supernatural work got to be involved here. And the more time I spend, the more it's unpacked. And it's like, whoa, how did I miss that? So when we read this passage, starting in chapter 3, verse 13, and ending in chapter 4, verse 6, we look at it as Peter speaking to believers who are just regular people who love Jesus and one day the knock comes at the door and it may be simply a, a, a fine for being a Christian or it may be the loss of their job or it may be now they have to go to prison or it may be that they're going to whatever means of death that particular culture and society has. So it's, a, it's, a, it's not a process of suffering, it's the potential of suffering even unto the loss of your life in, in your flesh. This. So when we saw in verse 18, Christ also suffered for sins once. And we moved on from that. We get to ver, uh, verse 1 of chapter 4, where he says, uh, Therefore... Christ. I realize that uh, the NIV and the New American Standard has, has the word since. Uh, the word is a participle, so it's an ing word. So you're, you're somewhere in there you have a, a, an ing action happening. And it's also a, a punctiliar port, uh, point in time, a historical thing it's talking about. So it's an activity that happened. And so we translate it, having suffered, and then for me, as you heard as I read my translation, uh, unto death. Because I'm, I'm not limiting this in our minds, and I don't want to cut it any shorter. You know, I lost my job because I'm a Christian. Well, I am very sorry. You suffered for Christ. And he lost his life because he's a Christian. Same suffering, but not obviously in the effect, but the same suffering. The one suffering up to this, and then the other suffering all the way up to that. It's the same suffering. So, Christ, therefore, having suffered unto death. Having suffered unto death. That's what he did. That's a historical event. It happened at a point in time. It's what he, what he accomplished, what was a what happened to him. And he says then, and this is where last week I spent some time talking to you about the datives, and typically I don't mention that, and I don't unless it, it affects how we have translated into English. And so I'm trying to bring it down to the quote-unquote first grade level so that, in a sense, a, a first grader could get it. And that's difficult but I need to at least try. It's the same thing we saw last uh, time, uh, starting in verse 18 and moving through. With the datives translated in the English as um, in the flesh or in the spirit. And as a dative, it's, it's, it, it's something that is going toward or to. And so there's the, simple, the simplest way of explaining it it is, it's, 
describing the means by which we're talking about the action. So it was by means of the flesh or, or in connection with the flesh or with relation to the flesh. And we, we, the reason that's important is because, and you've heard me too, in fact, it was in the last passage, 18 through 22, and it's in this passage, uh, verses 1 through 6, we, uh, the men death, on the one hand this and on the one hand this. Well, the reason that I, I draw attention to in relation to the flesh is because it is, it is different than in relation to the spirit, and it ends up, even if it's not so much clear at the beginning, by the time we get done with verse 6, it's pretty clear. We're talking about this in relation to this, and now we're talking about this in relation to this. So this happened here, and this happened here. And don't get those confused. It, um, and the reason that in connection with the flesh, uh, first of all, as it relates to Christ, um, he, he, he was a man. And if he had not suffered unto death as a man, then uh, honestly, uh, the whole matter that you and I have a Savior just wouldn't work out. It wouldn't have worked out. So Jesus had to have died in connection with the flesh. And we're grateful. You and I live in the flesh. But obviously, all of us here know that the flesh is not... Got to be careful how I say this. The flesh as we know it is not eternal. We already know that because it's already growing old. It will be changed and glorified. So in that sense, uh, there, there is a body we're going to live in that is somehow this glorified. And I can't explain that other than to say it's not going to be this so that if you die at four years old, you go to heaven and forever you're going to be a four-year-old. You understand what I'm saying? Or if you're 90 or 100, you're not going to be in heaven as a 100-year-old. You're going to be in heaven as a glorified body. So, uh, but right now we understand that we are in this flesh. We are in connection with this flesh. And it doesn't take much to check that out. Because you can ask yourself, am I hot or, I cold, or am I cold? And you figured it out. So it says then, Therefore Christ, having suffered unto death by means of flesh, or in connection with the flesh, he gives us a command. And that command is equip yourselves. And you're going to say, that's not what mine says. Mine says, arm yourselves. And let me explain that, as you know I will. It says, arm yourselves, because that's the word that Paul has used in previous um, portions in Romans. But it's in the context of military. Uh, Paul used military contexts to make his point. So the word, if we're in a military context, arm yourselves would be appropriate. It's grab your weapon, grab your shield, grab your helmet, grab your breastplate, and get out of here. But the word ends up being that if you're a plumber, you're going to equip yourself with the wrench and the other thing, <laughs> which I would have no idea what it is. So if you're a carpenter, a hammer and a saw, if you're a dentist, the thingy and the other thingy, uh, you're going to equip yourself is, is the whole concept here. It's not arm yourselves. This is, it's an inappropriate translation of the word to say arm yourselves. But it is appropriate in the, in the context to translate it as it is legitimately translated equip. So we equip ourselves. So what are we supposed to equip ourselves with then? He says, with the same idea. With the same, and this is where um, the word uh, is notion, idea, thought, purpose, intention. So Jesus 
was living his life to the glory of God. His purpose was to live his life to the glory of God and to fulfill the plan of redemption, and that's how he accomplished it. So we are to equip ourselves in our life, our walk of following Jesus, living our lives to the glory of God, living, and in that living, sometimes bad things are going to happen. We've already seen that more than once in 1 Peter, including uh, verses 13 and 14 of chapter 3. So in our living, we equip ourselves with the same concept um, of, of suffering unto death. And this is the reason for that command of equipping ourselves. Here's the reason. Because the one having suffered unto death with respect to flesh has been made to cease with respect to sin. Okay, I realize now that I enter into um, part of the problem that I had was, was this particular verse. It's as, as soon as you read, he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin, it's like, oh, so if I suffer, then I don't sin anymore. I mean, is that what it's saying? I mean, that's what it's saying, but is that what it's saying? It's not saying that. I'll make it easy for you. It's not saying that. I realized that I had some notes here to, um, notes about my notes, that gets scary, um, to make it easier for these things. So I'm going to go to my notes, I'm going to tell you verse 1, I'm going to tell you verse 2, tell you verse 3, etc. And uh, then I'll go back. So first of all, verse 1, think in the likeness of Jesus Christ, and here's why. When you've paid the price of your relationship with him, that is to say because of that, um, when you paid the price. In other words, you've suffered unto death, okay? Uh, there's no more sin problem, only glory. That's where I'm taking that. Verse 2, here's the motivation. Live the rest of your life for God's will. Verse 3, you've already uh, been there and done that. So don't go where uh, the Gentiles have gone and where you've already gone. Verse 4, they have an attitude problem. They reject the good news. Verse 5, but they will get theirs. That's scary. And verse 6, judgment through the gospel with relation to the flesh in order that they might live with relationship to the Spirit according to God. So uh, what did I say in all of that? Well, we're talking about those who have suffered unto death. That's what we're talking about. So your Christian brother or sister has died, not from cancer, not from being run over by a stray cart, but your brother or sister has died because they proclaimed Jesus Christ and someone said, we don't like that. And we're going to take care of business and silence you. So that uh, the one who has suffered all the way to, to death has been made to cease. This is an interesting thing because I never found anybody who translated the passive. Because it's passive. It's something that is done to them. They were made to cease. It wasn't that... I stopped sinning because that guy laughed at my faith. It's that I was made to cease from sin because now I'm glorified. In other words, I'm dead. I'm with Jesus. And you say, well, well, why did he say it that way? Well, if you're saying that, you can imagine what I've been saying for the last week as I've gone through these verses. It's like, Peter... Uh, there's probably a dozen different ways you could have said that. And so I struggle. <clears throat> I struggle with why he said it. I, it's my duty as, as the uh, proclaimer of truth to try to understand how God or why God moved him in this direction to present these things in this way. So what do we have? We have Christ, and he's the focus, and he will remain the focus. We have all that he accomplished, 
which we know what he accomplished. Uh, the, the symbol always is behind me, or in, actually in front of me as well. Uh, the cross, the, the, the price of redemption, that's what he did, that's what he accomplished. And he suffered, so he, he is our example in that, we already know that, but it's not, it's not just that. It's that in verse 1, he says, buy into it. Have this same notion, this same concept in your brain. And what that does, I'll tell you what that does, and if any of you watch, and I won't name them, but any of the uh, preachers on TV who uh, tell you how good you are and how good you've been and how much better it's going to be tomorrow than it is today. Those guys have never read this. At least they've never read it with any intelligence. Christ did it. And it cost him. So you have this notion. If you're a follower of Jesus... It's going to cost you as well. And there's about uh, four in the Gospels. There's about four different places that you could go to. And Jesus said, the disciple's not above the master. If the master suffered, do you think the disciple isn't going to suffer? The disciple reflects the master. And if they hate the master, guess who they're going to hate? The follower of the master. And if they suffer, cause to suffer unto death, the master, guess what they're going to do to the disciples? And that's a notion that is foreign to most believers. And honestly, one of the reasons I chose 1 Peter to preach was to come to grips with this concept for me. Because I don't want to suffer and yet Peter here says have this same thought and I sit there and go I mean I, I almost get queasy I get it's like this is this is one of those pivotal times where you're going in this direction and you think you know what you're doing and you, and you kind of, yeah, I'm going to suffer for Jesus. They're probably going to laugh at me today. And it's like, that's pretty far removed from what Peter is saying. He's saying, Jesus suffered all the way to the point of death. You equip yourselves with this same notion. And I want to rebel, and I want to repel, and I want to turn and run away. And yet, here's the whole thing, starting in verse 13 of chapter 3 and ending when we get there, which obviously due to time, I can see we're not going to get there. I actually thought I would get through all six verses today. <laughs> I am so deluded. <laughs> But the whole thing that Peter is doing here is to prepare us to think in terms of the master and not to, to gloss over when Jesus says, you're my disciple. What happens to me is going to happen to you. They hate me. You think they're going to love you? And Peter expands that in these six verses. And in verse 1, Therefore, Christ, having suffered unto death in connection with his body, his flesh, the realm of flesh, you equip yourself with the same notion. And I'm going to tell you why that's important, is what he's saying. Because he, he puts a because in there, and that's... I'm going to tell you why. Because the one, and that could be me, the one who has suffered unto death, the one having suffered unto death, 
Not the one who gets a little smirk when you mention Jesus or you carry your Bible and, you, and someone calls you sissy. No, we're not talking about those kind of things. We're talking about the price potentially paid for knowing the Master. Because the one having suffered unto death in connection with the flesh, with relation to this flesh, has been made to cease from sin. In other words, you pass from death unto life in the reality of not this existence. We leave this existence. We're, we're dead, and therefore we have nothing more to deal with. There is no more, uh, there's only smiles, there's no smirks. On the other side, you're glorified. You're in the presence uh, of the Master. You're in the presence of, of, of God. You're in the uh, presence of the angels. You're, you're, you're there. You're presence of all those who have gone before you. There's Adam. There's Eve. There's Abraham. There's Isaac. There's Jacob. There's Moses. There's David. There's Dad. You've been made to cease from the conflict I don't know about you, but I find that this particular statement is not delivered to those who play church or those who, I prayed the prayer. I prayed the prayer. I'm going to heaven. Now I'm going to go get drunk. So... The bar, Peter has raised the bar for us to be confronted. Not with this price paid for our sins, but for the price that we may be asked to pay. Not for our sins, because that was covered, but for being related to the Master. In the time remaining, verse 2 is the motivation. Live the rest of your life for God's will. And that's kind of how uh, we can read it quickly. And it goes back to when it says, so as to, um, or as a result, it, it refers back to the equipping. And equipping is a choice. Equipping is what we choose to do. Obviously, you don't have to equip yourself. You can... Show up to the job without your wrench, without your dentist drill, without your hammer. You can show up. And it's kind of like, why? Why did you show up? You need to equip yourselves with the same concept of suffering unto death so as no longer to live the time still remaining in connection with the flesh to the ways of men, which are lusts, but to the way of God, which is his will. And we see in there that the motivation for us in choosing to recognize that that knock on the door and the whoever shows up and says either you've lost your job or you've lost this or you're going to prison or you're going to the chamber, we live in such a manner recognizing that the time we've already had, the time still remaining, um, okay, okay, uh, the, the time still left. Because all of us are on a timetable, and we don't know, you know, I mean, we jokingly talk about me being the director of camp until I'm 102, which I think is 200 weeks of camp or something, and it's like, uh, we don't know how long we're going to live. 102, 82, 62, 42, 22. So the time still remaining, the time I have left is what he's talking about. The time I have left on this earth or the time I have left for his return. Either one, it, it fits. So as no longer, no longer to live in connection with the flesh. And we go back to that again in connection with the flesh. That's what Jesus died in. He died in connection with the flesh. When we die, we will die in connection with the flesh. And the time still re remaining in connection with the flesh, here I am, not to the lusts 
of men. I don't think I need to explain what that is. In fact, he expounds some of that in the next verse. Um, but we could expound on the will of God. And we've covered that twice, very specifically, on what the will of God is. Uh, Peter gave it to us and, and Paul gave it to us. The will of God. It's not mysterious. It's walk the walk that puts a smile on God's face. Walk the walk of, of faith. Walk the walk of obedience. Walk the walk of submission. That's the walk. And if you're living in connection with the lusts of men, you cannot do that. You cannot fulfill the will of God as you are connected with the lusts of men. The time still remaining. Uh, there, there is where we're going to head, you know, to, to conclude this today and pick up, obviously, next week. The time still remaining. Well, you know, what have I got? Who knows? The time I have still remaining, I am looking forward to... Um, Studying these things out, I don't intend to write a translation of the scriptures. I do not. I had to do that for this one because of some of those very prickly things that we read. And it's like, well, I see what it says. Is that what it means? And I wanted to try to clarify it. I hope I did. Uh, if any of you want that translation, I'll give it to you. Six verses. <laughs> it took me a whole week to sit there and go, oh, are you kidding me? But in the time we have left, what are we going to do? What are we going to accomplish? How are we going to live? Who's going to know? Um, gee, I, I wasn't going to give this illustration to close with because it's <clears throat> actually rather embarrassing. Um, at, the, uh, at the table the other night, the uh, manager, who has seen me now for about a year, year and a half, um, and has come and talked with the couple that sits across from me as I eat dinner with them. Um, and Keith just boldly, blatantly asked, so you, you know Jesus as your Savior? And she said, yes. And uh, then um, I, I kind of, then it kind of led to me describing my ministry, and she looked at me and said, how come I didn't know that? Oops. <laughs> yeah. You see what my point is? So, the title is Peter Fortifies the Believer on Suffering. And um, I, I could have said other things. Uh, certainly challenge. Certainly uh, challenge our point of view. Certainly expand our point of view. So that we don't think in terms of, you know, the boss smirked at me when I said I was a Christian and I suffered for Jesus today. It's like, that's not the concept here. And I hope that I've been able to move your, your minds when we talk about this. This isn't a slap on the hand. This is the ultimate price, potentially. Potentially the ultimate price. It may not be the ultimate price, but that's the whole concept because we don't often know. Just like the Jews in World War II when they were taken off, were they just going to, you know, be checked or were they going off to some concentration camp? And when they got there, they didn't know whether they would live or die. So we don't know. But we live as if it might cost us everything. That's the challenge. Peter has made it clear. It's not just a gauntlet thrown down. It's an instruction, a didactic for how to live our lives. And it will remain a challenge for me the rest of my life, especially as I have now come to grips with what he is saying. And I can't be excused anymore. Father, the, uh, uh, sometimes Jordan's stormy banks seem to roil over us, and we honestly do not know if we're going to be able to pass through 
And yet somehow, Lord, whether we pass through on a good day when the Jordan is flowing smoothly at low, low tide, or when we pass through when it's roiling and rumbling because it's just overflowing its banks, all of us will get to the other side. We don't know how, we don't know when, but we're going to get to the other side. We don't know whether our journey is going to be on the uh, easy and soft side or it's going to be on the uh, very hard, difficult side. Lord, we don't know. But by faith, we continue to place our hope in you. We look, we look through the mist, we look through the storm, and we see you, and we aim for you. We head toward you. We move toward you because we love you. You're the reason. For it all, not just the season, but you're the reason for it all. And you're our Savior. You're our God. Lord, may our worship continue to grow and expand uh, deep and broad. May we continue to reach forward toward you. Father, I'd say bless us for having be been here. Um, it's, it's bigger, Father, than what I thought it was going to be when we started on this journey. It's bigger. But it's not too big, either for you or because of you for us. So go before us in order that we might glorify your name and you might receive the glory because of us, not in spite of us. So we commit our way to you in the name of the only one that matters, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Amen.